Okay, everyone, let's begin with our next talk. Uh, for our next talk, I've got Richard Gold, and he's going to be talking about asset discovery, making sense of the ocean of Ozint. Uh, Richard is the head of security engineering at Digital Shadows. If you have been on his Twitter at all today, especially in the last six hours, you will have noticed that he has just released a new tool. Um, so I won't spoil everything by revealing what he has been talking about, because um, I guarantee this is exactly what he's going to be talking about today. Uh, so without any further information, there you go, Richard. Thank Cheers. Thanks a lot. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. I'm Richard Gold, as mentioned, uh, Director of Security Engineering at Digital Shadows. Uh, this is my first time talking at Recon Village or DEF CON, and indeed my first DEF CON. So I'm glad the shots are here to sort of help me through this experience. But um, I'm here to talk to you about asset discovery. Now, as part of the recon process, you need to discover assets. And that's something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about the last few years. And we've done a bit of work, we've done a bit of tooling, done some stuff, and I'm going to share that with you today. So I've got my little friend here, the Orca, who has been released into the wild this morning. And um, we'll be talking all about him and what he gets up to today. So when you're doing your OSINT reconnaissance, you've got a target, you're going to do some investigation, you're going to get started. It's tricky to define the scope accurately. So there are, um, for any particular organization you want to look at, if it's of a reasonable size, you know, especially these sort of large, sprawling, acquisition-driven organizations, companies who've bought a whole bunch of companies over time, they've maybe integrated them, maybe not, maybe there's infrastructure left over, maybe there isn't, they're in different countries, different jurisdictions, you have this huge, sprawling mess. And so figuring out what that scope is can be really challenging. And, and another issue on top of that is cloud, of course. So, you know, it's a thing. I think we've all uh, got to that point by this stage. And we struggle to find then the, the, what belongs to, to whom. In you, for example, if you have an IP address and you're thinking, well, this is an IP address, it's likely associated with my target. And then you find out that, you know, the day before they released the IP, it's gone back into the pool, somebody's pulled it out, spun up an NFS server, and now you're looking at some like crazy vulnerabilities you didn't even imagine would happen, and it's just a false positive, and, and you get crushed and go home and cry. Um, so it's that kind of thing really messes up the scoping aspect of doing the recon. And then on top of that, it's, well, what sources do you want to look at? So do you want to look at network ownership information? Do you want to look at social media to find employees? Do you want to look at um, documents that have been leaked onto the web? Do you want to look at the actual website itself, maybe a bit of AppSec, maybe you're looking for some misconfigurations, that kind of a thing. So, and there are you know, lots of great tools, as the, the speakers just now mentioned, which already exist to help you with all this kind of stuff. But typically, in, in our experience, these tools focus on the breadth of collection. So they're sort of the big advantage that they bring, and it is an advantage if you're doing that kind of work, is to look at you know, a huge range of different sources, social media, you know, um, blacklists, all this kind of stuff. But it can quickly become overwhelming, especially if you're looking at a, a big size target. So we struggled with this exact problem ourselves a bunch of times. And after sort of solving the problem, or attempting to solve the problem a whole bunch of times in a kind of manual way, we sort of the realization slowly dawned on us that, you know, computers are quite good at automation and maybe, you know, writing a program to do this kind of stuff for you might not be such a bad idea. So after much uh, sort of banging our heads on keyboards, we created the Orca. And this is our targeted OSINT framework for discovering networks and services related to our targets. It's now on GitHub as of this morning. So please do feel free to git clone it, have a play, see if you like it, give us some feedback. And you know, take it for us, take it for a spin. And it's specifically, the goals of it are really around making sure that the scope is narrow, spending quite a bit of time on making sure that you can establish the scope accurately. And then also spending quite a bit of time on asset traceability. Now we had this problem many times ourselves that we you know, do a whole bunch of recon, we gather all of this information and we'd find something that was kind of interesting. Maybe you find a vuln, you know, some old misconfigured server that had been abandoned, you know, some Linux box that had been spun up three years ago and abandoned. And you're like, oh yeah, 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 great. And you find this thing and you spend a bit of time on it and then you're like, 
who does this belong to again? Where does this come from again? How did we find this? And you know, we then you'd have to basically redo your whole recon process all over again just to find that piece of information to let you know how to actually you know, make that chain from where you started from to this like interesting finding that you had. So again, after doing that a whole bunch of times and then realizing that maybe we should really find a way to automate this, we've baked asset traceability into the Orca. And we'll go through all of this in, uh, during um, this presentation. But then this allows you to know with you know pretty high degree of certainty when you find something, the path that you took to get there. So in general, in the overview here, so what does the Orca actually do? It is, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff around domain discovery. So using both um, Google and Shodan. So we'll talk about exactly what that is in a second. Um, it does subdomain enumeration as uh, the, the speakers just now mentioned, very useful. So you take in you know, google.com and it gives you the subdomains underneath that. Um, and then once you've got these subdomains, you can enumerate them with Shodan to figure out what ports are open, what services are listening, if there's what type or the version type uh, of the software is running on it, and then are there any vulnerabilities associated with it? And if there are any vulnerabilities associated, are there any publicly available exploits available for that? So we can gather all of this information for you and uh, you know, gives you an Excel spreadsheet because the whole world runs on Excel, whether you like it or not. And um, but of course, you can always dig into the database yourself, and uh, you know, you can a whole bunch of like command line output stuff as well. But uh, we found that you know, we we spent a lot of time again taking the CSV or the SQL output from um, the database and then trying to make it into something that we could give to somebody else to do the follow up work. And uh, you know, so after, again, after cursing at Excel for, for, for many months, we decided to bite the bullet and write an Excel output. So you can get an Excel spreadsheet and you can give it to somebody to, to run with. So the end goal is to find vulnerable or misconfigured systems. So for, for us, we found it to be extremely helpful to be very, very specific about that. So we often had trouble before, as I mentioned, with this kind of taking a very, very broad view because you end up with this situation that you, you get all this stuff and you don't really know why you've got it. And it's could it be interesting, could it be not? And then you have a hard time justifying the impact of your findings to people. So you say, I found this kind of thing, it's kind of cool. And they're like, well, yeah, I guess, but why is it interesting? And being able to express it very clearly in that you have found something which is vulnerable Certainly, if something is vulnerable to a public exploit or something which is misconfigured, maybe it's revealing information that you wouldn't typically want to reveal to the public. Having this kind of very, very specific end goal, we found that to really focus the work that we did and gave us much higher quality results from our recon. So it also helps us to discard unnecessary sources. So if a data source is not helping us find vulnerable or misconfigured systems, we don't use it. And it also ensures that the collection is relevant. So when you are collecting something, you have a high probability that you're getting something useful out of it. Also for recon, I'm sure that you know, everybody here follows the same rules, but we found this sort of way of expressing it to be pretty, um, pretty concise. So no exploitation, no auth bypass, and no DDoS. So don't throw an exploit at something, although you know, obviously you're interested to know if something is vulnerable, but then you have to kind of keep yourself in check at that point, obviously. You know, breaking authentication, big no-no, and of course, dosing people is right out. So keeping those things in mind also helped us with our, how we should build the tool, decided what, uh, what things we should put in, what things we should leave out. I mean, I don't know if you've ever played with some of the tools which are out there which say, oh, we're a recon tool. And then you see it's like launching SQL map in the background and like, you know, Armitage, Hail Mary, throwing exploits at things. You're like, oh my God, control C. Ah. So try and avoid that. Uh, so, you know, the Orca won't send you to prison, which I think is, you know, a good selling point for any tool. So how do you find the assets which are relevant to the target? So again, in, in, when you're doing this kind of uh, enumeration, you want to be doing enumeration which is going to keep you in scope. So we're going to talk about the different ones that we do, but just to give you that, that kind of hint, you know, we are ensuring that, we, that the enumeration that we do keeps you in scope and ensuring that that 
is then traced, is then tracked in the database so that you can skip back to it afterwards. So you have a clear lineage between where you started from and then, you know, where you ended up. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about all the different enumeration techniques in just a second. So in a nutshell, this is what the Orca looks like. It has a very friendly user interface, assuming that you love the command line as much as I do. Who doesn't? I mean, come on. Um, so this is what it looks like. You, you know, it has help, has contextual help, and it gives you, you know, it's pretty uh, self-explanatory and that kind of thing. There is also, due to um, complaints from everybody else in the team, there's actually an example walkthrough on the wiki page, which actually takes you step by step through all the different features that the Orca has and can uh, give you a pretty good place to start for like what it's like to use the tool uh, in anger. So, where do you start? So, there's usually three pieces of information, one of three pieces of information that we start with. So, it's either the organization's name, it's either the domain name associated with the organization, or a CIDR prefix. And uh, that's pretty much the, the, the main places where you want to start. And then we have all the enumeration functionality following on from that to help you derive the assets you're interested in from these original pieces of information. But usually, um, when we were doing our OSINT recon engagements, we'd be given uh, just the organization name and somebody would rock up and go, hey, we're interested in, in this, this organization, we want to know more. And they say, well, okay, um, so you know, tell us all that you know about this organization. And they go, yeah, we just did. And you go, okay, well. Uh, so you've got to start somewhere. So at least, you know, if you've got a name that gives you something to get going with. A domain name if you're lucky, so that you make sure that you're again going after the right target. There's, you know, amazing how much overlap there is on the internet between different names and especially acronyms, which, you know, you'd think, uh, which I just end up being shared everywhere and everyone uses them all over the place. And CIDR prefixes, again, if you're really lucky, um, to give you an idea about the network ranges which are in use by a particular organization. So the initial enumeration step looks, you can do one of these three from those three types of information. So if you've got, for example, using PayPal because they have a really nice bug bounty scope, um, so you'll see a few of the, their, their domains and, and host names in this one, and uh, also um, Nmap, so they have a really nice set of vulnerable machines on the internet that you can use for recon, which is pretty nice, good for testing. So if you're starting, let me run over here, so you got your name, so you've been told, you know, pay, you're going after PayPal, okay? So you can use PayPal, you, do, you can use a search engine, so Google or Shodan, you can get paypal.com at the end of it if, you're, if everything works out properly. You can, um, if you're just given the, the domain name, you can do subdomain enumeration and get something like this out the end of it. And if you've been given a CIDR prefix, you can then enumerate all the different, ooh, that was close, sorry about that. Um, you can enumerate all of the uh, IP addresses inside of that side of prefix. So in terms of asset traceability, this is where it comes in. Um, you actually, so when you're putting in your first piece of asset data into the database, it gets tagged, so paypal.com gets a, gets a number there, and that gets an ID, and that ID flows through uh, when you do the next stage. So even when you've got to the next stage, which is you found this um, subdomain or host name. That will get its own ID as well, over here. And then that will flow through for a later, sub, later enumeration that you do for other things, network services, vulns, exploits, DNS, that kind of stuff. And, you know, but the, the original piece of asset data identifier follows along then with this piece of subdomain enumeration. So that by the time you get to your end state, remember we're looking for vulnerable, misconfigured servers, you can find out which piece of asset data it came from. So in some cases we'd be given, you know, in terms of domains, we'd be given a list of 2,000 domains, you know, 3,000 domains, and you're asked to like, give us, you know, give us, give us something, give us some cyber threat intel on this stuff. You're like, oh my God. Um, and again, being able to make that asset traceability, having it baked in into the database, means that it's really, really good for stopping you from making horrible mistakes and you know, inadvertently you know, reporting false positives back to your customer or to your own organization. So being able to really keep that like under control, I found that to be really helpful. 
So, so when we do a search like this, as I mentioned, like the, especially the organizational name, you put it into a search engine, you get back some kind of information, um, some set of domains. How do you know that the domain that you've discovered is connected to your target? And the answer is you don't. You just can't. There's no way automatically with a decent false positive rate you can be really sure that the name of your organization, of your target organization, is belongs to a certain domain that you get from a search engine. Doesn't matter which search engine, Shodan, Google, whatever, Bing, but yet yeah, you you just you just won't know. So you have to do additional recon yourself as an operator to figure out if that is actually relevant or not. So when you do that kind of thing with the orca, you can see like an example of the uh, syntax here that you, that you can use. Um, you know, if you're familiar with Python click, it's all that kind of text user interface, it's gonna prompt you um, when you do that initial recon. And it's gonna be the same also, not only for uh, searching for organization names, but also for CIDR prefixes as well. Um, we'll get onto that in a little bit later. But you have to have that prompting. You have to have that additional manual confirmation step. It's just the uh, ownership information, like you know, domain who is just simply isn't accurate enough. Um, and you, you know, especially if you're doing something where it's like a related name, and there'll probably be somebody called like PayPal Burger Company here in Las Vegas, which you know, just just because there's always something. So you've got to watch out for that. So it's a bit tedious, but. It's the only way you can get quality data. And again, it'll save you a lot of time later on when you're trying to disambiguate at the end of your process where all the hell this stuff came from. If you did all of that work up front, if you front load it and you spend your time at the beginning, you know, taking care of this much later down the line, you'll be really grateful that you did that. So yeah, just a note on terminology, subdomain enumeration versus host name enumeration. Um, generally used interchangeably, I also use them interchangeably. Not quite the same thing. Host name would be something like a fully qualified domain name, FQDN, and that will be like the full name where no additional uh, resolution is needed in order for you to, to, to use it. Whereas a subdomain will be, like in this case, beta sandbox is a subdomain of paypal.com. Just to uh, clarify that in case anybody was wondering. So. Subdomain enumeration, um, pretty pretty standard bit of recon. A couple of different data sets we use for that. Rapid7 forward DNS, great data set, talk about that in just a sec. Certificate so transparency, pretty good. And combining the two together, because they're slightly complementary and they have slightly different timescales associated with them as well. Talk about that as well. Um, uh, and we're using DNS dumpster for this public tool release so that if you want to enumerate the Rapid7 data, they provide you with an API that you can use, which is very, very cool. The four DNS data set comes from a whole bunch of different sources as well. So you can see the sort of things that they come after. They get you know, PTR records from DNS, they do um, sweeps of the internet, like with Mascan, ZMAP, to get you know, SSL information, so they pull the, the SAN, the CN from that. Uh, if they see HD, HTTP responses, zone files, all that kind of stuff. So check out their wiki page, which breaks it down pretty nicely. It's good to know where the data is coming from as well. And you'll see as well, when you do this kind of subdomain enumeration using the forward DNS data set, sort of certain patterns emerging. And one of the patterns you'll see is like quite, quite strange, long, complex uh, FQDNs, uh, host names. And the reason why that is, is because they're pulling it from the, the SSL certificates where they will have typically the, the full sort of name that they're using internally for a system, which is uh, quite, quite interesting. And that usually gives you some nice, nice breadcrumbs. So that's certainly something worth looking at. So certificate transparency logs. Um, most certificate authorities these days will be writing to the uh, certificate transparency logs uh, when they issue a certificate. Now that, if you're not already aware, is basically a global repository where people record what's being issued. Now it's a way to combat things like fraudulent issuing of certificates. But what it turns out is for recon is super, super useful because you basically have a real-time stream of certificates being issued. 
Now, Sage, they have a really nice uh, search interface for that, which is very helpful. The, um, the log is updated in real time as well. So if you're lucky, you can actually catch a server being provisioned and like an SSL certificate being issued for a server before the service is fully provisioned. So it might be the case that this happens before like certain security measures are put into place, before debug has been disabled, before you know, there's changes fully made from staging to production. So it's a really nice source to look out for. So that's why the Rapid7, the 4DNS, and the certificate transparency are quite complementary. So highly recommend using both of those together to get the most bang for your buck from your enumeration. Uh, as well as that kind of using sort of third-party data set enumeration, the Orca will also do enumeration of DNS. So you can give it a domain, it'll enumerate the DNS records associated with it, A, quad A, MX, TXT, all that kind of good stuff. But you can also give it for every single host name. And that's just like a flag you can set. Um, so that's very, very straightforward. It'll just crunch through all of the uh, FQDNs that you've discovered and check all the DNS records for every single host name you've discovered. And this is a real gold mine. This is really, really useful. So you get all kinds of interesting things. You see, for example, that which you know, mail providers, cloud mail providers, uh, organizations are using. That's usually really interesting, especially if you're like later on going to be doing a phishing campaign against them. Nice to know what they're, what they're using. You can fingerprint their security solutions remotely just with DNS very, very easily, which is brilliant. TXT records will tell you also what third parties that they're using because they will have things like the SPF record where they will say, oh yeah, you know, Salesforce, they can send email on our behalf or you know, all these different other services that people like to use. And that's really helpful, again, for, your, for any follow-up work you will want to do from that. And you can also, um, another one which I really like is the C name, the canonical name. So what you can see is that they'll have something which will be like SSO dot, let's say PayPal, SSO dot PayPal dot com, and that will be the, the A record, but the C name will be something like blah, 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 PayPal dash Okta dot com. So you'll be able to see which is the actual service they're using for something, whether you're fingerprinting uh, you know, login, like SSO solutions, or um, CDNs, or you know, anti-malware, spam filtering, all that kind of stuff. Being able to see what's actually being used, what actual third parties are being used just from the DNS recon is very, very useful. So that gives you a lot of very good information already about your target just from the DNS resolutions. So the Orca will handle all of that for you, put it all into the database, so you can have a look through it later. If you don't want to use the Orca, this is a kind of a busy slide, but a mass, uh, I think Jesse mentioned in the previous uh, chat, great, 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 great tool, OWASP mass, highly recommended if you're not already using it. You know, the bug bounty people are clearly all over it. Um, you can see all the different sources that it uses, absolutely brilliant. Um, you can then get it to give you out just like text output, and you can take that text output and import it into the Orca. So if you want to use a mass first, and you know, because you're more used to it, you can then use that and import it into the Orca. It has an import from file command, and uh, you're off to the races. So yeah, just wanted to give, <laughs> don't have to read all of that, just to give you an impression about all the kind of cool data sources that um, a mass uses. Uh, so big shout out to that. So CIDR ranges, um, the Orca does not dis support the discovery of CIDR ranges currently. Um, so you will have to discover them on your own. But the network ownership information that you can get from the various providers, and you can also get it, you know, it's all for free. The Whois databases you can get for free if you, you know, show that you're a security researcher with a valid use case, which is pretty good. Um, but you can get like some really nice information. So you can see, you know, for example, in this case with eBay or PayPal or something like this, you can see the network range and then you'll you know, see the ownership information so that you can uh, correlate that. Again, where it really falls down is whoop, cloud providers. So this is something which is like a constant headache, really, because, you know, especially these days, many companies, they don't even bother owning their own infrastructure. So, many, you know, back in the day, these sort of more traditional companies still do it. But, they, you know, they'd have, well, we bought this range of IP addresses, and it's registered to us, and that's ours, and blah, blah, blah. And you'll see, you know, a lot of companies will use, um, or smaller companies will tend to use just like straight ISP allocations, like AT&T or Sprint or something like that. So the ownership information 
if you would take one of their host names or domain names and resolve it, you'll get it's the generic ISP as the ownership information, which doesn't really help you because you don't know which other stuff has been assigned, you don't know if it's shared, and so it's, you know, it's a bit of a, bit of a dead end, a bit of a rabbit hole, really. Um, and then, following on from that, a lot of companies nowadays will be using the cloud, and you know, you've got yeah, Azure's, Amazon AWS, Cloudflare, Google Compute, and you end up with all kinds of stuff. And again, as I mentioned already, people will, you know, spin up something, use it, give it back to the pool, and then that IP address where you found that sweet, sweet vuln will just disappear into the ether and you end up looking at somebody else's, you know, like it's a cat walking company or something now rather than that financial services company you were looking at. And, you know, it just, it's just a mess. So we recommend at least just n not looking at the cloud stuff unless you're really, really sure. You typically have to have some other external method of corroboration to make sure that, you know, you really got the right piece of information. Uh, you know, you're looking at the right IPs and that they're, they're being used right now. And so there's, and again, like the previous step where we talked about having that kind of prompting where you go through the different, uh, different steps and you get prompted to say, yes, this, this is the one I want to add. No, yes, no, yes, no. You also have to take a similar approach with the cloud stuff. Um, and again, for these sort of organizations which are pretty much, you know, cloud native, you've got to be pretty careful. So you've got to really know what to, what you're looking at. So, um, the good thing is these cloud providers, as examples, do tell you which IP addresses that they use. So if you've got the, um, and the Orca will give you the network ownership information once you've done an enumeration of an IP address, for example. So you will see who owns it, but you can check as well yourself by just pulling down these, these different um, lists of IPs. So that's uh, yeah, a little bit of uh, our experience. So now we've gone through the uh, enumeration of getting hosts. So now we've got a bunch of different ways. We go from domains, company name, ciders, boiled that down so we've got a bunch of hosts. Now we're gonna look these up in Shodan, very popular tool which I'm sure everyone is, is, is very, very familiar with. It is pretty impressive. You do need a paid key for this, but it's very, very cheap and you get so much for this. So I don't feel too bad and uh, Mathly does a great job. So I, uh, I don't feel bad about promoting that here. So what this does is that you can give it an IP address and you get back the ports, obviously, which is pretty handy. So, you know, if you put in like the scanme.mapp.org, you get back which ports are open, which is pretty nice. And then you get also back the CPEs, the common platform enumeration. And um, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in just a sec. But as I mentioned, you also get like the network ownership information, you the modules, which is pretty nice. So here you can see on the, the this on ScanMe, the ports which are open correspond to the modules which are which are listed here as well, which is pretty cool. But the really nice thing with Shodan is that it will tell you which modules are in use even if the ports are changed. So if you're running, for example, a Telnet server on some kind of weird port, because why not? You decided to run it on 3389 just to mess with everybody's heads. You'll actually get the module telling you that it's actually a Telnet server, not an IDP server. So that's really, really cool and a, something we make a lot of use out of. So that's a, definitely a pro tip. But yeah, you get this, um, you get this great f information back from Shodan, which you can then take to the next stage. So as I mentioned, the, the CPEs, which are really, really cool. So they are the common platform enumeration, and that will give you uh, the vendor, the type of software that's in use, the version number, and here you know you even get like the beta flag, which is pretty cool. So again, this is back to our main goal, right? Our goal is vulnerable or misconfigured servers. How do you want to tell something is vulnerable remotely? without actually like attempting to shell it over the network, which is you know against our rules of engagement. No shelling. Um, being able to get this fingerprinting information, which then allows you to have a reasonable level of confidence about the vulnerability of a particular service is extremely, extremely useful. So these CPEs are then mapped to CVEs, now by Shodan itself. And we used to have to do all of this stuff manually ourselves with, you know, 
a bunch of different tools that we were using. And then one day we looked into the Showdown Helper and it had all of the same information that we'd all been looking for or been building ourselves all of that time. So that was cool. So you can just use the CVE information, so the common vulnerabilities enumeration, um, information from MITRE, so you get a really nice list of the vulnerabilities associated with a particular service. But we don't want to stop there. Absolutely not. So you get the CPE to CVE mapping from Showdown, but then you want to know, like, is this really exploitable? Because so many CVEs don't have a publicly available exploit, so the risk is pretty low. Again, you want to be convincing people that, you, you know, your customers or your own organization, that we found something which is actually of value, which is something they should care about. And so we, uh, so we can store all of this information in the database. You see all of these, you get the CVEs, you get the CVSS scores, you get a bit of information about it. And we integrate with uh, CVE Search, which is a great little platform. Um, you, it's uh, a great little database, and it gives you, like, it gives you basically a web interface to the exploit DB database, a local copy, so you don't have to break out to the internet all the time, which is pretty handy. So the Orca will then take the CVEs which you've discovered for all of your all of these hosts that you found, and check to see for those CVEs are there any exploits available, and we'll store that exploit information into the database. So then you can actually go back and say well, we found these vulnerabilities, and of this subset of vulnerabilities, these ones have a publicly available exploit. And you can even like, filter out for, like, I only care about RCE. I don't care about DOS, I only care about RCE. So that gives you a pretty powerful um, platform to build on, and I say it's a very good way of finding something which you can persuade somebody about. So you can footprint quite quickly somebody's entire infrastructure, and just have a look at, oh, well, these are the services which have publicly available exploits for them. And even if, for some reason, the exploits maybe don't work or wouldn't work because maybe there's a platform discrepancy or there's something, there's some little issue which is going to set it off, it's usually a good place to start looking. I mean, you know, you, you get something which is vulnerable to a CVE from 2008, there's probably something else interesting lurking behind the scenes there. So CVE search is really cool. We find... Um, Inside of the Orca distribution, you'll have the instructions about how to set it up. Uh, it does take about like six hours to build the first time, so you have to be a little bit patient, unfortunately. Um, but once you've got it, it's, it's super, super useful. So we, uh, we get a lot of mileage out of that. So a great little project and uh, really nice to integrate it in with the Orca to have that all in one place. So now there's an, ex you know, back again to the goal. We want to find those vulnerable systems. So this is what the, uh, the Orca has like an explore feature where we can give you um, it has sort of a, a representation of what's in the database without having to do like a whole bunch of SQL queries or without exporting it to Excel first because maybe you just want to look at it quickly on the command line. So you'll get a bit of information about the host, information about the services. It'll tell you like which CPEs it detected from Shodan. And so here you get, you know, the vendor, the software version, in, uh, the software type, OpenSSH in this case, and then the software version, which is pretty cool. You get the information from Showdown that gives you the banner information, so you can see like what's happening in the banners. And usually there's something you, usually something pretty interesting in the banners. Telnet banners are great; they're, they're usually pretty hilarious. Um, all kinds of information in there, so you can really get a quick overview. And again, this is a way of sort of supercharging your recon, so that. You know, you get the information that you care about back as quickly as possible and as being able to you know, get what you need without having to, you know, waste too much time going through all of this unnecessary data. Because again, we're tightly focused, we're just caring about vulnerable and misconfigured systems. So, once you've collected all of this information, you've got, you know, you've done your subdomain enumeration, you've done your showdown enumeration, your DNS information, enumeration, you've you know, looked up, see if there's any exploits available. Um, again, if you've got a very large organization you're going after, it's difficult to make sense of it or to get that, that sort of those nuggets that you care about. So the Orca has a, a rules and sort of tagging engine uh, built into it. So uh, it's extensible. You can just, they're just written in, in, in JSON. You can add your own if you want to. And um, it's a great, it tags 
the assets that you discovered according to whatever rules you put in. So one example is um, remote access. Again, that's something that we look for a lot when we're doing recon. You know, you've got an organization that's got put in a whole bunch of ciders. You know, it's got a slash 16, a slash 8 in some cases. But so you've got a whole bunch of information which has come back. And you're like, well, okay, it's got lots of web servers, but I'm not too interested in those. I want something which is more directly useful. And you know, remote access is a great place to start, right? VPNs, SSH, RDP, all that kind of stuff. So um, the Orca can just tag that all up for you so that when you get the output, you can just filter for that particular thing, for example, remote access, and then you can just see from the like 50,000 50, hosts you've discovered, those 300 that are IPsec VPNs, SSL VPNs, RDP, all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's something we've uh, found to be very useful as well. Um, also, for example, yeah, load balances is, you know, you can pick up if there's an F5 there, for example. So, uh, if there's a Windows operating system, as I say, there's a, a whole bunch of different rules in there for tagging up the results that you've got to make it quicker for you to find the things that you really care about. So, as I say, it's extensible, so you can always, if there's something in particular you're looking at going after, it, you, can, you can easily add that in, which is pretty handy. And so then exporting, all enterprise software competes with Microsoft Excel, as the saying goes, and uh, recon tools are no different, it seems. So as I said, after spending ages having to do this kind of conversion manually, we decided to just use the XLSX writer module for Python, so it will spit out. This is a very, very small snapshot. Um, I had trouble trying to get it all onto one slide, but basically all of the information which I've talked about so far will be put into the spreadsheet. It'll have multiple tabs. It's got one for DNS, one for vulnerabilities and exploits, uh, one for the sort of overview of all of the, the, the host information, has all of the, the showdown information, all that mapped in there. So then you can just take that and use sort of standard you know, spreadsheet foo to, to make sense of it. As I said, one particularly handy thing is to do the filtering for remote access so you can immediately see, oh, these are all the remote access machines that, that this organization has. I can then take that and then map it to, for example, breach data and see, oh, is there anything that's got creds for that kind of, that system floating around in breach data, which again is a pretty uh, high impact finding, which people would probably be very interested in. So that is pretty handy. So, in conclusion, the Orca is a tool for sort of supercharging your OSINT, for giving you quick access to the things that you care about. It's focused, it's tightly scoped, it doesn't look at any unnecessary data sources, lean and mean, just the ones that you care about to get your job done. So, looking at how do you find vulnerable and misconfigured systems. Um, it starts with taking in organizational names, domain names, and uh, CIDR prefixes, and from there you can discover subdomains, services, vulns, and exploits. You can tag up these results, give it all to you, and export it to Excel. And you can also say it has an explore feature, so you can look at it all from the command line, which is pretty easy. And if you're really desperate, you can just go straight into the database and uh, you know, use some Postgres foo to, to get out the stuff that you care about. Um, it's been released into the wild as of this morning. You can get it on GitHub, so please take it for a spin. There's an example walkthrough there which goes through step by step all the different features of the Orca, how you can use them to find the sort of things that you might be interested, whether it's for your bug bounty, whether it's for your red team, whether it's for your own organization, or for the lulls. So that's all from me. Thank you very much indeed for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot. Thanks.